Hey, welcome to another episode of Story Now. Now, there are two types of film that end up with sequels. The first are those that seem to be part of an overarching story to begin with. Uh, these would be like your Batman Begins, your Matrix, your Lord of the Rings. Uh, these are hardwired, these have sequels hardwired into them, uh, making it a natural extension of the storytelling to have a follow-up. These are focused on setting up the beginning of a longer story arc. Then you have those other movies that have sequels, the ones that work pretty much as standalone stories. They have their own beginning, middle, and end and are so wildly successful that a sequel is shoehorned on at the last minute. Now, it goes without saying that this latter type generally has a much more difficult time of being a viable movie. Because given the, the standalone success that it must follow up, there are really two different ways they can get it wrong. On the one hand, there are those movies that try really hard to be its its own unique story to, to follow a new vision that they end up foregoing almost any similarity to, the, to, to their predecessor except the name. Uh, this would be your Mission Impossible 2, your prequel Star Wars trilogy, and the like. Then there's the far more common nature of this, the, the, the follow-up who tries desperately to be the first movie only new. In this case, they try to adopt every element, every characterization, and every conflict that was so successful about its predecessor. And these movies then try to repackage it and resell it. The problem with this approach is that they are never able to recapture the dramatic weight, the freshness, or the excitement that the previous movie was able to bring out. Now, what about Catching Fire, which arguably follows a movie as self-contained as the former? It's neither of these. It manages to hit the balance perfectly, and thus is a textbook case of how to follow up a successful movie with a better one. Now, as many people know, uh, Catching Fire is the second of four movies that are based on a trilogy of books. So it can be, it might be a little confusing why I refer to it as the sequel to an existing standalone film. Um, the point is, while yes, it is based on, on a book that already existed that was part of a series, the fact of the matter is, functionally, if not intentionally, the, the first movie and the first book of the series actually um, function very much as a, as a standalone story. They're very clearly not setting up anything for the future. It's this story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It follows certain characters through a very specific event, uh, sees how they transition and deal deal with that and where they end up at the end. Um, it's, it's, it's the classic problem, solution, end. Uh, and I actually, I don't know this, but I wouldn't be surprised if the first book, uh, The Hunger Games, wasn't intended to be a, a single standalone novel that later had sequels that uh, were designed after the fact. Uh, again, I don't know, but that's, that's, that's how it feels as a story, that it does seem to function as its own thing and as something that has to be followed up rather than a story that has to be continued. Uh, that being said, there is something very important to learn from Catching Fire and The Hunger Games, which is how to do adaptations of, uh, of a multi-part book series. Um, they really were able to trade off the fact that the book series had been finished before they started. So they were able to understand exactly what each book did within the larger whole and what the themes were for each part and, and how they evolved and how the characters evolved. That way, a lot of the contrasts that, that were set up were actually there because they knew what the first one was for and how they had to set the second one up to play off of that. So aside from everything else, I think one of the, the, the key factors in determining how this was a successful sequel was that they waited. They didn't jump in uh, 
like like they did in uh, Harry Potter or the Game of Thrones, where they said this book series is selling. Let's make it into a movie or television series or whatnot right now before we know how it's going to end up because that way you know what's important, what you can simplify, what you can reduce without uh, uh, sort of cutting at the, uh, at the plank you're standing on. Now, given the fact that this is an analysis of the story and the fact that it is a direct successor to the previous movie and so its premise is based largely on the ending, there will be huge spoilers for the ending of the first Hunger Games. So please do not watch any more. It's really, it's really an experience to watch it for the first time. Uh, or read it, because the, it is based on an equivalently exceptional book. Uh, that being said, I will try to avoid as, as many Catching Fire spoilers as I can. Uh, but given the analysis of the, game, uh, of the movie's premise, there will naturally be some people clever enough to jump to certain conclusions about, about the story, at least up until the midway point. Uh, but I will definitely, definitely not give away the ending or any of the, the post-halfway twists. That being said, let's, let, let, let's talk about Catching Fire. Now, Catching Fire is is based on the ending of the first movie. The Hunger Games have ended. Katniss and Peeta have survived by by basically manipulating the system uh, somewhat, and that has sort of shown the capital in a negative light. It's also inspired rebellion in a large number of the districts, which has led to a crackdown and more violence. Now, this is set up very beautifully in the very opening sequence. What you see is the, the woods, and it's winter. Now, the first movie had been a, a sort of set in, in fall, and, uh, you know, it, it, was just, it was just how it was set. But in this, by shifting the season, they were able to convey a lot. Uh, first of all, it, it showed the progress of time. And it showed that this is this is after that. But aside from that, thematically, it, it seemed to reflect the state of the world. The the rich and powerful are now bunkered down more in their in their in their wealth and opulence and power. The poor are poorer, are angrier, and and overall the world seems harsher. Uh, and you also are dealing with the fallout of 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 previous events, uh, both in terms of the world and the way the world is is seeming to burn, uh, and in terms of the characters. And so that first shot where you see Katniss sitting in the woods uh, in winter really works because she looks scarred. Uh, unlike the first one, she's not hunting, she's not moving, she's doing nothing. She's just sitting there. And the trees are bare, there's, there's ice all over the place, uh, the setting works. And so right from the get-go, you, you, you sort of get this feeling of, of the effects of the last time and of greater stakes, greater hardship. Um, now, things in the districts are not at all well, there's conflict, there's chaos, and, uh, you know... President Snow, who becomes a much more prominent character in this story, blames Katniss uh, for this turn of events. And at the same time, you're seeing that, uh, that Katniss's character is learning, uh, as a famous hobbit once put it, you can never go home again. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't return to the way things used to be. Uh, she's trying to get back into her life. She's trying to uh, rekindle s some sort of connection with uh, with Gale for for some inexplicable reason, and and trying to return to her life. But she's finding one that she's uh, preoccupied by her memories, and two that the world has changed. That her events, while motivated out of a, a 
survivalist mentality really did did affect the world and have affected change that she wants no part of. Um, and that's that's where the story starts, with the scars and the fallout from the first movie. And you that's where the, that's where they start tying it back into into a new setup. Now, the way things would normally work, the way the world would work, is they're done. They're they're supposed to be living off in their in their victor's village that they show nicely, uh, and they function. At, they're supposed to function as mentors to to the new scapegoats or tributes or offerings or what have you, uh, as Hamish did. Uh, and slowly you see that uh, her actions have not only caused her to survive and fit back into the system, but they've actually subverted the way the way things normally work. And so gradually shifting off from that, they're, they're, they're sort of t able to work in uh, another go in at the arena. Now, uh, arguably the trailers and, and promotions for this setup were just really bad in terms of of uh ruining the the sort of mid mid movie climax like this is really something that's built up to uh and is actually a really dramatic moment in the middle uh, when they learn that uh that victors will have to go back into the arena as part of this special event the the 75th games but um that being said it's still a very emotional moment and uh the build-up to it really works. I, I really would have preferred if they hadn't let people know. I obviously had read the book, so I knew everything. But if they hadn't put that in the promotional material, I'm pretty sure it would have been a much more uh, a startling announcement. Now, obviously, they wanted to show off the set pieces in the games themselves and uh, in the training. But it really would have been better, in my opinion, to, to, to let that, that hit you, that these people have to go back. Because the beginning of the movie really doesn't feel like like uh, like they're going to go there, and the way they slowly change things, and the way uh, the capital forces sort of thrust in parry with the the rebellious forces, and how Katniss seems sort of caught in between trying to trying to make things work out, it really works, and it really really does show the desperation that everybody feels. Uh, when when that when that decision is made, uh, that being said, the the premise works brilliantly and uh, gets gets you back into those games, and that's that's really where you start seeing a lot of the differences between this and the last film. For a successful follow up, there need to be three three key things. There needs to be a good plausible premise, a reason for them to return back to the setup of the first film. There needs to be that balance, that, that trade-off between new material that keeps it moving forward and old material that keeps it grounded in what it was and what it's supposed to be. And there needs to be dif there need to be differences. And that is really what you can learn from Catching Fire. How you show differences, how you make a plot different from its its uh, its predecessor, and how you play on those differences, how you use those to tell a better story. Now, as far as these differences go, there are several, and they they really work. The first one is is the scope. This is not about one person who is worried about their family. This is not about the trials of a child in a, a horrendous system. This is about the system. And so in every aspect, the movie zooms out. Now, this works very well for two reasons. One, when you shift your scope, either expanding or contracting it, you instantly change the interpretation of everything. When you go in, Everything has to be centered about the character that you're focused on. Everything has to relate back to that character. And you're able to see every minute thing in much greater detail. You're, you're able to invest more in every, in every occurrence and every individual because you're going in in terms of scope. However, when you go out, 
you then see macroscopic consequences. You see where those arbitrary decisions, where those systems come into play. And so that, that was a really smart move here. They zoomed out. And so it wasn't about, about uh, Katniss and PETA and Hamish and everyone. It was about the system in which they live. It was about the consequences that, that actions that they take have back on the system and about the system and uh, how, that, how that works, why it works, and what it, it's un ultimately based on. Uh, and a large part of this is, is alluded to in the movie's tagline, the, the, the one quote, remember who the real enemy is. Uh, it's not about children fighting each other. It's not about survival. It's, it's about what's happening outside. Why are you in the ring, not how do you survive the ring? As part of this, uh, President Snow, who had been a sort of background figure in the first movie, really, really becomes much more active. You see him, especially in his interactions with Katniss and his interactions with uh, the new games master, Plutarch. Um, you see where he's coming from, what what he's what he wants and how how far he's willing to go to do it and this works one because again it it, it it's part of of zooming out and and looking at the system as a whole which basically is represented by snow but it also helps illustrate where where he was coming from in the first film in the first one he had maybe two conversations with the games master and they were they were interesting and and they helped establish that there was a larger governmental purpose, a larger control purpose that the, the games had aside from everyone else's pageantry and pomp. But now you really see what he was getting at and what he was worried about in the first film, because now it's not so much of you know the media and you know all of Panem and the capitals being evil and the enemy and exploitative. It's more about the differentiations, and you get a lot of that in the characters of uh, of the Plutarch, of Effie Trinket, who gets a much more expanded role, and of Snow. Now, Snow represents the orthodoxy, the government, the one, the ones that'll do whatever it takes, and his interest is in order and control. Uh, then you have uh, people like the new games master and. Uh, Stanley Tucci's Caesar character, who basically runs the games for the public. Now these people are are in in this are using the system and are using the games, but for them it's more more of a, a stable institution on which they can build their own lives. These are people who are by no means good, by no means have any sort of morality on it, and actually are are aware that they're feeding off of the lives. Of the of the tributes, but for them, it's it's not occurred to them that the system can change. They're merely getting ahead as part of the system. And then you have characters like uh, like Effie Trinket. Now, while Effie Trinket had been part of the bizarre and garish uh, capital culture in the first film, here you really see her as as the representative of the ordinary citizen of the capital. Now, this is not someone who has any. Uh, who's taking advantage of the system. This is not somebody who's trying to control people. This is just someone who lives in a privileged part of the world, who's who's enjoying the spoils of the, the conflict and of the, of the horrible system without actually being aware of what the consequences are. For her, the games are, are, are an ennoblement. They're... They're a fact of life and something that, that should be celebrated. And so when you see her dealing with the new turn of the games, of these, these tributes that she's so proud of, of almost having coached into victory, like a sports team, which is, which is really the best analog that you have for her and the, the citizenry's approach, that of a sports game, then you really see her her sorrow, and you see how she, how invested she has actually gotten in in sort of her players. So that differentiation really helps turn the capital from an evil people eating machine 
into a society and into to people who all interact with and exploit the tributes, but who all have, have vastly different levels of investment and honestly, vastly different levels of moral blameworthiness. Um, that being said, the, the nature of the games are also incredibly different here. First of all, the very fact that you're reaping from, from previous winners makes the tributes far more interesting and, and far more memorable. And the story really doesn't hesitate to, to play that up. Uh, you're, you, you, while you may know maybe two or three of the other tributes uh, in the first movie, aside from you know Peta and Katniss, maybe, maybe you know Rue, maybe you know one of the career tributes that was particularly memorable, but they, they, they were all pretty much just... Uh, just other kids who were who were in the the grinder. Here, almost everyone has has some form of personality, and all of it stems from the 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 scars that they bear from their time in the in the ring. Now, these are all people who are people who are uh, sorry. These are all people who are capable people who have succeeded in such a situation before. Uh, yet also, they're people who have had to stand in a ring and watch twenty three others die some by their own hand, to survive. And there are people who, who rationalized that and stored it away to various extents, people who, who never expected to be part of the system again, who are now tossed in. Uh, these are people who not only have been through what, what Katniss and Peta have been through, but they're also people who have been through what Hamish has been through. Uh, coaching people, teaching them, sending them into the games only to watch them inevitably die. And in that way, you really get these, these flawed, damaged characters who are simultaneously really interesting. Almost all of them have a very well-defined personality that, that works and that, that in the context of both who their character is and in terms of, of the story as a whole. Um, the thing is, you become sympathetic. You become invested in them. Uh, you... It's no longer it's no longer you rooting for a girl with a bow to to kill the other faceless drones. It's about you seeing this tragic situation. And again, that ties back into their into their tagline. Remember who the enemy is. It's not about you trying to fight these other people in order to survive. It's really a tra more of a tragedy that's been put into play by this this system that uh, that Snow comes to represent. Um, now, Plutarch is a bit of an enigma in this story. Um, you're sort of not clear where he's coming from, what he really wants out of it. And uh, again, for people who, who, who are sort of looking for, for holes, some of his decisions, especially the fact that he seems a little restrained in the way he's running things, don't really seem to make that much sense. They do end up explaining it a bit, but for a large part of the movie, his character is really uh, a fluid and in flux, um, which, which is, you know, explained and in hindsight it works. But when you're watching it, there is this slight sense that something is not quite right, and I think one problem is that it's not so much something is quite not quite right. In terms of the character, sometimes you think that something might not be right in terms of the story, and uh, that that means that it could have been disguised or it could have been, you know, explained a little bit better. Now, uh, in terms of of the pre the pre game setup, one of the most interesting differences they build is in their objectives. Now, if you remember the first film, Hamish had been all about you have to. Uh, you have to hide your talents, you have to isolate yourself, and you have to be all about your own survival. In this one, interestingly, they're told something completely different. Uh, the games are supposed to be very, you know, different and challenging, and they're actually told to make allies and friends, which is a very interesting change-up, because now you see that they're going into the same place, but... Almost perplexingly, they're told to do something completely different. Now, again, this pays off, and this pays off a lot better than uh, than than the enigma of Plutarch's character, 
this pays off fairly early on. You sort of understand what was going on but and why it was necessary. But it's really interesting seeing these people who go into the games, especially from Katniss's perspective, go into the games knowing something of what they're in for and then instantly have to go completely against their instincts and experience. And again, that's a huge difference that helps turn this into something more, into into not just a rehash. It becomes almost a remixing, a reanalyzing of the aspects in seeing why did you do what you did? Why are you doing something different now? What is at the basis of this situation and of this system? Um, now, when it comes down to it, there's also another very interesting almost uh, social commentary type aspect running here. Um, you have the ring, instead of in the previous movie, you had the ring as a setting. It was a place. Now, obviously, they were manipulated, they were monsters thrown in, they were hemmed in. But for the most part, it was it was child on child violence, as you know, horrible as that sounds. It was, it was all about murder. It was about climbing on top of one another. Here, again, not to go too far into it, because it's a really interesting reveal and setup, but here it's much more about surviving against the elements and against the challenges of the ring in particular. The ring almost becomes a character. And so when you see them struggling against something, you can actually see the, the, um, the game maker and snow. And often it cuts to them creating, creating the, the challenge and responding to the, the reactions and responses of the tributes to these situations that they create. So the ring becomes its own thing. And because of that, you tend to see a split amongst the, the tributes. You have people who are playing the game, and then people who perplexingly are not playing the game, who are, are working together to survive the elements and the ring. Um, now, in the first one, everyone was playing the game. And they were all in it to survive uh, with, with, you know, a few, a few isolated exceptions, like uh, Katniss and Rue, and then uh, Thresh, who was the other uh, District 11 fellow, and Rue. But generally, Katniss wouldn't even let herself become close or allied to PETA until it was announced that they could win together. Here, from the get-go, people are, are not playing the game. There are definitely people who aren't playing the game. Again, I'm not going to spoil who, I'm not going to spoil why, but... Uh, it's very different. And so then you see a few people who are playing the game. And these are almost like uh, like the equivalent of blue pills, people who are so plugged into the system that despite the fact that the rules change, despite the fact that they are now being told to die for no reason whatsoever, they're still plugged into the games. They're still going to, to fight one another, to kill one another. But again, this is underplayed. For the most part, it isn't the, the splashy violence that uh, you saw in the first movie. It's more about survival. It's more about the elements and about the ring, which, which again, is really interesting. And, and you should definitely, definitely look out for that. Um, and in terms of, of, of that part of the movie, one thing that really worked was while, while uh, Stanley Tucci's Caesar character had a really strong role in the beginning, they almost completely strip him out at this part of the movie. Instead of constantly cutting back to exposition or giddy responses, it's just, it's told straight. It's focused on the games and on the tribute's responses to the games, and the only interplay, the only cuts are to the game room are to the people directly creating the hazards and directly designing the the challenges that that have to be overcome. Another interesting aspect is that uh, Katniss and Peeta sort of face uh, the mirror syndrome. There's there's another pair of characters in in the film who who function as they function, who are are basically two people who are looking out for one another uh above above their own safety um and so this is this is an interesting way of looking at their characters from the outside but you you see the sort of suspicion and the the 
you know, general general reaction that an outsider would have to Katniss and Peeta's um, configuration, as you would say, to their to their really strong uh, alliance or or whatever. Um, and because of all this, all of these differences, you're able to you're able to plug back into that same premise into that ring. And it never feels uh, it never feels like a rehash because everything is being reinterpreted. Um, one thing is, it never really focuses on what's the same. It's all about the differences. They assume you've seen the first movie, you know what the basic setup of the Hunger Games are, and so unless they tell you this is the difference, they assume you know what this what, what's the same. They assume you know what's being changed, and that works again because if you're watching a sequel, it it really helps to not be talked down to that way. It doesn't it doesn't say okay, I'm assuming you've forgotten this, so let's focus on exactly the same aspects of exactly the same story of exactly the same you know premise it says okay you know all of that stuff now let me tell you what's changed and a lot as we as we've been talking about has changed and eventually because you're so invested in the in the differences it's able to while it, while in the beginning it transitioned from the post post hunger games back into a new set of games through the games, you're actually able to transition out and see the story become something more. And you're you're able to, to, to go into the familiar premise and then break out of that and in a way that feels satisfying, see how how the story will move forward. Now, um, again, in a large part, this is because this this functions as as a as a as a trilogy in two parts. Um, the this and uh, Mockingjay, the last part of the story, really were designed to intermesh uh, much better than than either one intermeshes with the first one. Um, so the transition works, but aside from that, the focus on the differences really helps that transition, which which was exceptional. Now, no discussion about a story can be complete without discussing how it was told. Uh, and so let's, let's take a moment to talk about the craft of this movie. Uh, as far as the pacing goes, it was phenomenal. Now, that was one of the strongest aspects of the first movie, the way they, they didn't seem to rush into their, their big set pieces and action sequences, but really spent a lot of time setting up the, the characters and the story and the world. And... They 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 do they're able to pull it off once again in Catching Fire. The movie has some great set pieces, some great uh, action sequences, which for obvious reasons I will not tell you about. But it does hold off until the later half to get to them, and the first half really is about people, about emotions, and a lot of the best movies do tend to to take this balance. They do tend to lay out the groundwork and then spend a relatively shorter time on those set pieces. And Catching Fire is is certainly one of one of the best. The longer run time, it, it, it also works this way because, as we discussed, they are zooming out. They're talking about more of the world at large than just individual peoples. And they are showing the context in which the first movie took place and sort of forcing you to reevaluate choices made in that movie. So the first movie clocked in at about two hours. This clocks in about 2.30, but... It, it it works. It it makes it makes sense from a story perspective. And to be honest, a, a two and a half hour movie isn't isn't as strange as it would have been about five ten years ago. So it's all good. Uh, the cinematography again, one of the best parts of the first movie carried over here. Uh, it feels intimate. It feels raw. They 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 have none of the glitz and glamour of of typical Hollywood fare. Uh, and that serves very well when they're showing the, the, the abject poverty as well as the glamour of the capital, uh, which just from the way it's shot is is meant to, to be not at all appealing. And it's not it's not as though 
they showed it as unappealing in terms of objects. It's just the cinematography is designed so well to show the contrast and to evoke the the sort of disgust at its opulence, uh, which which is which is fairly well done. Uh, this again was was carried over from the first movie, uh, and it feels in this movie they managed to make it so that the poverty was was worse, the the opulence was much more, and the contrast was exacerbated. But again, the change in setting, you know, helped explain that to a great deal. Uh, now talking about some of the performances now. You know, I will get to Jennifer Lawrence and her exceptional exceptionalism. But one of the really surprising parts of this movie was was actually Joss Hutcherson as he was portraying Peta, the the male protagonist. Now, if you look back at the first movie, he had a sort of one note role, and he played that fairly well. But it was basically the boy next door who's sort of thrown into a situation he can't handle. He's sort of the male damsel in distress, which actually is kind of cool as a thing. Um, but again, he didn't have he didn't have much of a role. Here, he's got a lot more to perform, and he does it admirably. He balances the dry wit, the likability, uh, and just the crowd-pleasing personality that, that uh, that's supposed to make him such a fan favorite, while at the same time, he, he really shows a lot of the sadness and the longing uh, of, of his situation and, you know, the tragedy of how he's pulled back from his safe life into the games. Uh, and above all, he's able to show a great deal of hope in adverse situations, the way he plays certain uh, responses and is able to contrast that against uh, Katniss's uh, responses to those situations, the way the way he counterbalances her cynicism, he really he really does does manage to to play that without seeming like the over trusting naive fool. He, he does seem to be a genuinely hopeful fellow, and that's great. Uh, in particular, there's one scene uh, in the latter third uh, that he shares with one of the Morphlings, which is a strange name, but uh, which which really helps contrast his character against that of Katniss's. Uh, by directly paralleling and yet differentiating itself from the sequence that she had at roughly the same point in the first movie. Uh, if you've seen it, you know you know what I'm talking about. And that, that I think, was, was done very well. Now, people who've read the book know that in Mockingjay, which is a third book, and it's going to be the, the next, next few movies... His character becomes incredibly complex, and this was actually a, a source of some concern to me when I saw the first movie. When I saw how how he, he he was playing a very simple simple character, but if you watch Catching Fire, you'll you'll become it, it set me at ease because he he seems like the type of actor who could carry forward into the incredibly complex and conflicted character he will become. Uh, that being said, the the star of the film, Jennifer Lawrence, was fantastic. She she managed to play the the underplayed and and subdued responses in the majority of the film, uh, in in an exceptional form, while also showing if in a few sequences, uh, in a more intimate setting, really strong emotional reactions. And while again, this is something that's been done a lot, and it's it's not exactly groundbreaking. What's great about her performance is the way she ties it together. Uh, when she when she's underplaying emotions in in the majority of the film, you can still see that those you can see the flicker of those reactions. You can see the slight tells that she's repressing it, and she does still feel like the character who would feel the the depths of emotion that she's not showing. And conversely, when she when she's uh, in a more intimate setting, she's she's showing her actual response. It doesn't feel like a separate character, which is a great failing of this type of uh, performance in a lot of films. It feels like the same person. She feels, and it feels this way a lot because it's not just an emotional response. It's not just you know over dramatization. It actually feels like these are emotions that are chaining off of repressed re responses. When she is sad or when she's horrified and she's showing it, it feels like this is. This is something that's been bottled up and building up in pressure that that, that comes out, and conversely, th th this this plays out very well when in in the next sequence she'll go out in public and and play the 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 cool and collected you know 
persona that she adopts, which is fantastic. Um, getting to the supporting cast, Woody Harrelson was phenomenal. Uh, he also had a much, uh, a much bigger role in this film than the last one, although his role was uh, suitably complex and interesting. It really didn't have as much prominence in the first movie. Uh, here, he he gets a lot more to do, and he does it fantastically. In particular, uh, his response when when the the new games format is announced is is really amazing, and uh, again, one of the great emotional scenes of the film. Um, and his you can see the way his relationship with uh, with Lawrence's character has evolved and changed. Uh, they've sort of gone through the same crucible now, and they now sort of have the same job. And so it's it's really, really interesting to see how that plays out. And he does a phenomenal job. Um, now, Liam Hemsworth didn't really do much in the movie. His performance was fairly weak. Now you could argue that this works for the film that that his his failings are 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 sort of setting up something or part of the part of his character but it does seem a little one note he he does sort of seem to just be that other guy that you see in movies or in high school the the one who's appeal other people really can't understand and who's basically just there to uh serve as angst fodder for the the nice guy um i guess he could he 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 could he could use this uh in where his character is going it definitely doesn't go against his character but there wasn't as much nuance and that doesn't work in in terms of the performances and characters he's going off against um now Stanley Tucci, phenomenal. Uh, he he plays the same the, the same uh, uh, MC he did in the first one, but uh, whereas in the first movie his role was more exposition, uh, and thus a lot of his appearances were more about about uh, about explaining things to the to the viewer. Uh, here he's able to play off the, the more interesting part of his character, the the guy who's really excited. Uh, about and sort of participating in the games themselves and so his responses particularly in the sequence where where you have the the interviews like they were in the first movie going completely different uh you can really see the sense of this guy who's sort of uh sort of feeding on on the games and on on the lives of the people in the games which which is great and he plays it plays it very well um then, then you know Elizabeth Banks, her character again, uh, shifts from being part of the system to being someone who, for her own silly reasons, is invested in the characters, and so her performance is able to become uh, much more than just just a ridiculous uh, personification of the capital, and again that that works really well. Uh, the scene where she's she is choosing names, heartbreaking. Uh, when when she's interacting with with uh, Peta and Katniss and and trying to show her solidarity, that's that's all fantastic. Um, so yeah, she 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 works very well. And again, it's it's not so much that her perf performance improved; it was just that uh, Elizabeth Banks was given a a much more expanded role in this and uh, was really able to take advantage of that. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, Lenny Kravitz playing Cinna, the designer. Uh, to be honest, he, he plays pretty much the same character as the first one. His role is the same. And, again, there's something about his performance that's just really appealing. Uh, he, he, he really underplays his emotions, uh, almost, almost like Keanu Reeves. And, again, that, that works. You, you sort of have to tease out his emotional state. And uh, he seems like a much more real person. He doesn't go on trying to say, oh, I'm sad now. Oh, I'm happy. He's, he's much more about, much more like a, a real person. He's, he's, he's mature. He's part of the world. And so it takes a lot to make him, him react. The, the soft stuff is sort of, sort of buried. And that's, that's great. It really works for his character. And uh, it's fantastic.
So yeah, that was uh, Catching Fire, a textbook case of how to make a successful follow-up film. Um, Again, this has been Story Now, my analysis of story writing, uh, what we can learn from it, and what we can change, which in this case was pretty much nothing. Um, Stay tuned. I will be putting up a new video in the next week or two. This one will probably be an analysis of person of interest. Uh, So look forward to that. Bye.